aphids susceptible called fire. The terminals would literally be covered with aphids, hundreds of aphids per cane tip uh, in midsummer. So lots of aphids up here. Down here, we never find, we have to look hard to find aphids. And so that's when we started thinking of uh, leafhopper transmission didn't work. The virus incidence is high up here. The crumbly fruit is high up here. So maybe we should be looking at aphids. And this is looking at virus incidence, raspberry leaf model virus, the Clostra virus, in a five-year-old field from northern Washington, basically 100% infected. And raspberry latent virus, where was I going to go? Okay, raspberry latent virus in this same area, we were probably more, we were closer to about 40 to 50% infected at five years. And I'll explain why that's probably happening. In southern Washington, right down along the Oregon border, this is an eight-year-old field, no raspberry latent, and less than 20% raspberry leaf model. And here we're seeing very little crumbly fruit. So now we're thinking maybe these things are playing a role. So this is a summary here. At two years up in northern Washington, raspberry leaf model, we're getting <coughs> a fairly high percentage already. At five years, virtually 100%. Um, in southern Washington, even after eight years, it's quite low, and in this case, it's low as well. And these are data from Diego's work last summer, and this, he did a total of, he did over 500 samples last summer, so it's a significant number of samples that he's looked at. So again, it's widespread in northern Washington. It's raspberry late, and it's definitely spreading more slowly than raspberry leaf models. And both of them are relatively rare in the southern part of the growing region. And the presence of those viruses, the presence of the aphids, matches pretty well with where we're seeing the most severe crumbly fruit. So are one of these, or both of these, involved in crumbly fruit? So again, high incidence of crumbly fruit and all three viruses, <coughs> raspberry bushy dwarf, but very little of the others. So now we start looking at transmission. Again, most of these, all of the known viruses in the real virus, real viridae that infect plants are vectored by leaf hoppers or plant hoppers. And in several transmission studies, we never were able to get um, leaf hopper transmission. Even when we collected leaf hoppers from fields that were 100% infected and just put those on healthy plants, we didn't get transmission. And also, if we look at leafhopper populations, they're very high in Oregon, southern Washington as well. There's not really much difference in the populations of those two. So the plant real viruses, the three different genera, all transmitted by leafhoppers. And also, they replicate in the leafhopper. So that serves as a source of replication, maybe overwintering, but another source of runoff. So the transmission of raspberry latent, um, <coughs> when Diego's working with aphids, he would put the aphids on a source plant for different lengths of time, take them off, and then put them on healthy plants and see, and transfer them every day to see when they would start transmitting. So they had to feed on a source plant for at least 24 hours to be able to acquire enough virus that they could transmit. And once they acquired that virus, it took them seven days, so after 24 hours you could transfer them to a healthy plant and transfer them every day, and it was seven days before they started transmitting. So there's that late period in the aphid before it can actually transmit. Um, suggesting that maybe it's replicating inside the aphid, and the virus titer is building, and it's moving through the aphid slow. Um, and the real viruses and leafhoppers can be transferred, very early transmitted through the eggs. So Diego looked at collecting, he had adult aphids on infected plants, and then collected young aphids. Every morning he would go and collect the young aphids, put them on a healthy source, a healthy plant, and let those develop into adults to see if they were positive or not, or if they would transmit. And out of 30 aphids, uh, he, you know, he hasn't done a large number, but 30 out of 30 so far have not been able to transmit. Uh, so the, the transferable transmission occurs, it's, it's not at a high rate. And then he also was able to extract RNA from individual aphids, and you can use quantitative PCR to look at how much virus is present in the aphid. And those adult aphids, 
that he used, that he picked the young off of, were positive for the virus in qPCR. So they did have virus. And, and the young aphids in qPCR, well, they all developed to mature adults before he tested them. And they all tested negative by qPCR. The actin gene worked, gave a nice PCR band, suggesting that the RNA extraction was okay, the RT worked, so the system seems to be working fine. Um, but we could not detect virus in these aphids, uh, trans any transcranial transmission. And right now we're in the process of looking at these under EM to see if we can actually visualize the virus in the aphids. And this is looking at raspberry titer in aphids. So this is quantitative PCR. One day after putting them onto a source plant, 24-hour post, 24-hour acquisition, and then 24 hours after that. So this is a one day, five days, 11 days. So the further you move to the left, the higher the virus titer because you're seeing that signal with fewer cycles of replication, fewer cycles of PCR. So he's getting a about an eight-fold increase over those 10 days. So crumbly fruit. Now, in the mixed infections, what's happening with these different viruses as far as do we need both viruses there? Do we need three viruses there? Do we need any, any two? Um, and how do the two viruses interact with each other? And so he's been doing some work on qPCR, looking at raspberry bushy dwarf, raspberry leaf model. And he's also setting up field plots to look at the impact on establishment and so they were put in last spring, so we have establishment data now. And he'll be looking at fruit quality this year. And I'll show you some slides, but there's obvious growth differences during the first year. And this is looking at the, again, looking at virus titers in plants. This is raspberry bushy dwarf when it's present in plants by itself. These, I think there's three replicates here. They follow pretty close to each other. And here's another three. Um, raspberry bushy dwarf from mixed infection with the presence of raspberry leaf model virus. And we get about a 500-fold increase in the titer of raspberry bushy dwarf if the raspberry leaf model is present. And this is a cluster of virus. They tend to have very strong inhibitors of RNA silencing. So it definitely interacts um, to enhance the level or titer of raspberry bushy dwarf. Um, the raspberry leaf model, when we do qPCR, we get the same curve whether or not bushy dwarf is there. So leaf model is not going up and down, but bushy dwarf goes up significantly in the presence of um, raspberry leaf. I mean, bushy dwarf goes up significantly in the presence of raspberry leaf. So this is the field plot. He put it in about the 1st of June last year. These are plants that have three viruses. There's some here with two viruses. I think these are healthy. and. We're pretty sure we're going to get some fruit off of these this summer, but it's not going to be much. And you can see from this, even if these plants with three viruses do develop into mature, full-size plants, they're, they're, not, they're not going to have a commercial crop this first year. So in addition to being out of production for that year of planting, in this case, even if these do develop into full-size plants, you're going to be out of production the second year. So you're losing that $30,000 per hectare that second year as well as the first year. So it's so the establishment is much much uh, delayed, and he's got a similar plot in Oregon. This is up in northern Washington. So, is it working solo? Uh, we're not sure, but we're guessing not. We're guessing that there's going to be a significant interaction between uh, leaf model latent and bushy dwarf, or at least two of those. We also see. Um, blackberry crumbly fruit um, when bushy dwarf is present, but it's always in mixed infections. And it, with, with raspberry, blackberries it's a little bit different because when you harvest the fruit, the receptacle comes with the fruit. So the, the bear, the, even though there's only you know, 10 or 12 droplets there, they stay stuck to the fruit. The quality is greatly reduced. You definitely can't use that as a fresh market. Um, but they don't fall apart like they do with raspberries. When you pick the raspberry, the receptacle stays on the plant, and it's just the micro hairs on the droplet that hold everything together. So if you're missing two or three droplets, the fruit falls apart. So it's much more susceptible to fruit crumbling. And then in blackberry, we also, in this particular cultivar, we get a very bright yellowing of the leaves. And we have other blackberry cultivars. This is a healthy 
other black bear cultivars where we do not see this type of symptom and we have bushy borer plus the other viruses present. And this is tomato ring spot, it's a nematode transmitted virus. Um, we see it in northern, Wa northern Oregon and southern Washington, we don't see it up north. Um, and this one seems to do a pretty good job on raspberries by itself. You know, uh, very significant damage. And in this particular field, they took it out and replanted with blackberries, no soil fumigation, and eight, nine years later, there's no symptoms of tomato ring spot in blackberry. We have not seen tomato ring spot go to blackberry in the Northwest. A tomato, tomato ring spot is not a big problem here. Tobacco ring spot is a big problem in blackberry, but we don't see tobacco ring spot in our area. Lewis yellow nut, this is an interesting one in that we pick this, we test for this by grafting whenever uh, in all the material that comes out of the breeding programs to make sure they're free of known viruses. And this is the type of symptom to get uneven growth or eventually you get yellow netting. And so we've been going through, we haven't gotten any positives, hadn't gotten any positives. Well, there's some sequence information available for this virus now, so we did all, started using PCR. And using PCR, looking at our quote, virus tested collection, we're finding a number of clones that are testing positive for Rubus yellownet virus, even though they're negative in the graft indexing. So that graft indexing, I don't know if we've been selecting for isolates that would not show symptoms on our indicator, on our graft indicator. Um, but these plants were all negative in our graft indexing. We had, we had a whole series of tests we were doing. We had one plant that looked a little funky. It didn't show the typical Rubus yellownet. So we just tested for everything that we had and it came up positive for, for um, Rubus yellow net. This is actually a positive for toenail. And we went and tested all the others, and these did not show any symptoms at all. And you can see there's a high percentage that are being missed by the indicator. Is that a Bad news? No. The, the raspberry leaf model is one that I would expect, because it's phloem limited, or phloem associated, so it might be more difficult. But uh, and look, when we test the grafted plants, they're positive. So the, the, the transmission worked. It just didn't develop symptoms. So, so now what we're doing is biological indexing and laboratory indexing, PCR or ELISA. And whenever possible, we want to be doing all of these, especially when we're working 